Hi guys, listen to this <coughs> award ceremony with Dave Chappelle, an open tribute to comedians, black comedians, and also the presence of former President Barack Obama and his wife and also his security secret service agents. Take a listen to it. One thing that really caught my interest is the teleprompter uh, jokes, which a lot of uh, comedians are using. Is this? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Chappelle. No pressure. Uh, during the civil rights movement, uh, the I can't I can't read what's on the teleprompter. <laughs> Some <laughs> about Black America and White America. There's Black Americans and there's White Americans. We're all one America. So so if you don't mind, this is a, this is not live, is it? I imagine whatever I say, you could just you could just edit it out. Let's try it a few ways. Lou, are you in the booth? I am. All right, good. Uh, you know what, Lou? Let's just play around with it and see if we can get it right. Get this clip package on, and then, and then let me go home. All right? All right. All right. Count me in. Five, four, three, two, one. Wu Tang. I'm just with you, Lou. Let's do it again. We're gonna do it again. We'll get it right. You know, when I was a comedian starting out in Washington, D.C., right here in this city, 1988, I'll never forget this, it was a comedy club owner that banned profanity from his comedy club. He said it offended his audience, and this was a, a cause of major concern for all the comedians in the circuit. And we all called a meeting, and we had the owners come, and it was the club owners, and it was the comedians. It was the classic labor dispute. <laughs> the club owners laid out their case. There cannot be profanity in these clubs, because that offends people. And there's a comedian who's still a good friend of mine to this day, he's right in Washington, D.C. He stood up. And he said, he's black, I should tell you, because it's important to the story. <laughs> he says, I use profanity because I live a profane lifestyle. <laughs> he says, I don't have an insect infestation in my house. I have roaches. <laughs> my favorite comedians are like musicians. And the audience is their instrument. And the music they make is your laughter. And that's the laughter that I scored my entire life to. So now, some of my favorite American comedic composers. Thank you. When I lose my job, I lose my man. Treat me like a dog, he called me a dog. Yes, he did, what did he call me an old dog? Sometimes I wish I was a dog, but he was a tree. <laughs> when you stop and think, football's a fair sport for my people. Only sport in the world, a Negro can chase a white man and 40,000 people stand up and cheer. <laughs> See, in my neighborhood, the kids have a kind of a dubious reaction to that whole Santa Claus concept. They just don't believe that a white man will ride a reindeer through Harlem after midnight. <laughs> In truth, white friend, it's you that all look alike. <laughs> but look at the black people around you. We're all different colors. Black walnut, burnt out almond, chocolate, chocolate mocha, pecan, vanilla, yellow, mellow, light, bright, and damn near white. We come from the first people on the earth. <laughs> you know, the first people on the earth were black people. We the first people had thought. Right? We was the first one to say, where the am I? <laughs> and how do you get to Detroit? I think maybe like 30 years ago, there was a woman that wanted to sing, and a black lady that sang opera, that wanted to sing, what was her name? Mary Anderson. And this place was, was like segregated, and they couldn't sing there. And here we are like not even 50 years later, 
22-year-old black man on stage getting paid to hold his God bless America. I got to go now. Y'all take it easy. Bye-bye. Janelle Monet, Will Smith. Solomon, black man, election manager, and Bazoni. Yeah, man. Well, you ladies are right. To be honest with you, your lives look terrifying to me. They do, man. I know nothing about being a woman, but I know fear. Oh, I used to live in New York when I was 17, and I couldn't even pay my bills. You know what I did to make money? I used to do shows for drug dealers that wanted to clean their money up. And one time I did a real good set, and these motherfuckers called me in the back room. They gave me $25,000 in cash. I was probably 18, 19 years old. I was scared. I thanked them profusely. I put that money in my backpack. I jumped on the subway and started heading towards Brooklyn at 1 o'clock in the morning. Never been that terrified in my life. Because I never in my life had something that somebody else would want. I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, if motherfuckers knew how much money I had in this backpack, they'd kill me for it. And then I thought, holy shit. What if I had a pussy on me all the time? <laughs> That's what women are dealing with. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> it's real talk. If them same drug dealers gave me a pussy and said, put this in your backpack and take it to Brooklyn, I'd be like, nigga, I can't accept this. <laughs> I empathize, man, you know. Everybody gets mad because I say these jokes. But you understand that this is the best time to say them. More now than ever. And I know there's some comedians in the back. Motherfucker, you have a responsibility to speak recklessly. Otherwise... <laughs> New York Times said uh, that Louis C.K. jizzed on his own stomach. <laughs> you know, I've busted a lot of nuts in my day. None of them were newsworthy. <laughs> Shit was really gross. Because they didn't just say it like I said it. They didn't just say jizz on the stomach. They said it in that fucking Pulitzer Prize winning style that the New York Times has. It was very descriptive. Like, you know what I mean? Louis C.K.'s semen shot out like a volcano of misogyny. <laughs> Slowly drizzling down like lava, <laughs> covering his freckled penis as it slowly dripped to a fiery crown of red hair. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, I'm trying to eat some Wavell's Rancheros. And this niggas is... You know, the tough part, being a comedian, knowing the motherfuckers, everybody comes up to me like, did you know? Did you know what Louis was doing? No, bitch, I did not know. <laughs> the fuck you think we talk about at the comedy club? Hey, nigga, how was the weekend? Great, man. I was just jerking off in faces and coming on my own stomach, having a good time. You know how this business is. <laughs> no, I didn't know. They act like we sit around like Greece. Tell me more, tell me more. Did she put up a fight? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know the choreography, but you get the point. You get the point. <laughs> she was intense. But Louis was like the turning point. I mean, you know, I, all these allegations are terrible. Louis was the only... <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but fuck it. 
He's, his allegation was the only one that made me, like, laugh. <laughs> well, you think about it. <laughs> it's all his friends reading it, and he's jerking off, and he's surprising people. He's surprising me. I just picture all the comics and comedy just reading it like, what? <laughs> it's terrible. I know it's terrible. I'm sorry, ladies. You're right. You are right. But at the same time, I mean, you know what I mean? I don't know. Jesus Christ, they took everything from Louis. I was like, I don't know, it might be disproportionate. I can't tell. I can't tell. This is like where it's hard to be a man. One lady said, Louis C.K. masturbating in front of me ruined my comedy dreams. Word. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I dare say, madam, you may have never had a dream. <laughs> Come on, man, that's a brittle spirit. <laughs> that is a brittle-ass spirit, nigga. That shit is too much. It's a grown-ass woman. You know what this shit is like? It's like COINTELPRO. You know what that is? It's a program that the FBI had on the J. Edgar Hoover. In this program, one of the many things they did was they would track the sexual habits of anyone they considered an enemy of the state. It was a lip button. That's why they got all these fucking sex tapes with Martin Luther King fucking bitches. But lucky for us, he actually had a dream. <laughs> You think if Louis C.K. jerked off in front of Dr. King, he'd be like, I can't continue this movement. I'm sorry, but the freedom of black people must be stopped. I didn't know this nigga was going to pull his dick out and jerk off like this. I just thought we were going to get a couple of drinks and chill. <laughs> Show business is just harder than that. Them women sound like, I hate to say it, y'all, they sound weak. I know it sounds fucked up. I'm not supposed to say that. But one of these ladies was like, Louis C.K. was masturbating while I was on the phone with him. Bitch, you don't know how to hang up a phone? <laughs> how the fuck are you going to survive in show business if this is an actual obstacle to your dreams? I know Louis is wrong, ma'am. I'm just saying I'm held to a higher standard of accountability than these women are. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget what I am. I am a black dude. Awesome. Bishop is really, really awesome. Thanks, you guys, for listening. <laughs>